Welcome. Welcome to Christ Church of the Valley and uh, welcome West Covina Campus, the launch. It really is amazing, isn't it, that we've gone from San Dimas to Atawanda, Lone Hill Group. Uh, was the first group to set the, uh, the blaze the trail for us, now opening West Covina. And uh, as you turn to John 14 and get ready for our text, I want, you to, I want you to know that we know, the people at West Covina, we know the hard work and effort that goes into this. I, I, I was part of a setup takedown crew for 10 years in New Zealand, 10 years. So I know what it's like when you set up and you take down every weekend. And if you do that, it's because you've got a great passion to use time, talents, energies that God gave you for a purpose greater than yourself. And I just think of the, the, the volunteers over there, probably in the uh, probably couple hundred volunteers making this happen every weekend. And we're so proud of them. And there is no greater endeavor, no greater cause, uh, no greater reason to sacrifice and to be generous than to help people who are far from God come near. Amen? Man, that's what we do. Now, because we're taking a turn now, and we're going to the next phase of the life of our church. We're starting a series called Now, meaning that now is the time for us to take the next step. And there are seasons in life and ministry that we do that. And you have to stop and ask the question, why is it so important that this valley know about Jesus? Why don't we just go on with our lives and have our beliefs personal to us and kind of leave everybody else alone? You know what I mean? Let's just believe what we believe and go on with life. And of course, the answer to that was spoken by Jesus himself in John 14 when he said, I am the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. And he says, if you really knew me, you know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Now, this treasure that we're taking, and it's a great time to pause, stop here just for a moment. This treasure that we're taking, that, that we found, imagine finding a treasure, but in order for you to give it to other people, at first it seems highly offensive because that's the treasure that we're taking to the valley and to the world beyond. Why is it offensive? Well, because we are living in a world where tolerance and inclusivity are the highest values. You can do just about anything you want, but you can't be intolerant and you can't be exclusive. And yet Jesus comes along and says that he's incredibly exclusive. He says, there is no other way to the Father than through me. And that message, when it's given to the people around us, is highly offensive. Part of the problem is that tolerance and inclusivity used to be defined this way. We used to say that to tolerate someone meant that you could have differing ideas and opinions, but there was never a reason to discriminate or to persecute anyone. And we agree with that. Just because someone disagrees with us, there shouldn't be any persecution. You should be able to believe whatever you want to believe in this United States of America or anywhere else without fear of being persecuted for it. That's the appropriate definition and the historical definition of tolerance. You and I can disagree, but we still love each other. But we have changed it over the last 20 years. Now we've stopped saying that tolerance means that people are equal under the law. Now we're saying that ideas are equally valid and equally true. That you can hold an idea that I can't come against because somehow it's offensive to you if I disagree with your position on a certain truth. Now, the problem with that is, is that yes, we agree people should be treated equally under the law no matter what they think or believe, but it's loony to think all ideas are equally true or equally valid, especially when they diametrically oppose each other. Now, so why would we as Christ followers have a message of exclusivity in a world that's going to struggle with it? And the answer basically is simple, isn't it? Number one, because Jesus claimed exclusivity and backed it up with the historical reality of the resurrection. Here's the thing. If you rise from the dead, you deserve to be heard. I mean, second, there are major fundamental issues with inclusivity as defined, all ideas are equally valid and true. Now, this first part, the first part of the message is gonna feel like a root canal, but I gave you an easy time last week. And I told you you didn't have to think much and I told you to sit back and relax, but this weekend I wanna ask you to think, and this is important. You've gotta be able to enunciate and explain to people why we bring this message. Because inclusivity, first of all, 
the way we define it, as all ideas are equally valid and true, violates the foundation of reason and debate. Think about it. Two statements made about the same thing that diametrically oppose each other cannot both be true. It's impossible. If I tell you my wife is pregnant, half hour later I tell you my wife is not pregnant, there's no way both of those statements can be true. Unless it dies the death of a thousand qualifications, those statements both at the same time cannot be true. They are diametrically opposed toward one another. So you have the Christian message that comes along, Christ followers, the Bible, Jesus himself, claims to be the son of God who died for the sins of the world on a cross. Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. I pre-existed Abraham, says Jesus. In other words, Jesus, according to John 1, 3, was actually taking part in the creation of all things. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing has been made that was made. The Bible says he's the creator and sustainer of all things. The Bible says in Hebrews, sorry, the book of Genesis, God speaks and says, let us make man in our own image. Who's us? The, the very name of God, Elohim, is plural to let you know God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So the Bible is very clear that Jesus pre-existed Abraham, that he's part of the Godhead, that he was involved in creation, and Jesus' message is very clear that the only way you can come to the Father, the only way you can be saved is by grace and mercy, no merit of your own. So salvation is not something that can be earned, and a relationship with God occurs outside of religious effort, so that your hope and your future reside in a deep relationship with God the Father. Now, be careful how you look at this because I have a great respect in one degree for my Muslim brothers. I have still have a lot of conversations with Buddhists and people in Islam and Hinduism. I was given a book when I was in India, Why I Am a Hindu, and I'm reading the thing from front to back to understand people who disagree. But understand that my Muslim friends will tell you that Jesus is not the Son of God, that it's blasphemy even to suggest that that it's impossible for God to have a son, that Jesus is not God, he was merely a prophet and a teacher, equal to but not greater than Muhammad. He did not die for the sins of the world. In fact, as far as I know, historically speaking, Islam is the only movement that denies Jesus died on a cross at all. And the fundamental teaching of Islam is salvation is based on merit, not grace. One is saved by keeping the five pillars of Islam, by traveling to Mecca, if at all possible, and by being a good person and submitting ultimately to the will of Allah. So again, logically speaking, two statements made about the same thing that diametrically oppose each other cannot both possibly be true. You cannot say Jesus is the son of God who died for the sins of the world and then say Jesus is not the son of God and he did not die for the sins of the world and both of those statements be true. They are mutually exclusive. You with me so far? The headache's almost over. Two... Two, inclusivity works under a false assumption. And the assumption is this. Religions of the world are fundamentally the same, only superficially different. Most people who know nothing about religions will say this. They're all the same. No, they are fundamentally the same, only superficially different. When the opposite is true, they are superficially similar at best and fundamentally at their core different. Joe Klein writes, anyone who believes that there are inferior religions is a right-wing extremist. Now, do we really want to say that religions who offer child sacrifices are not inferior? You say, wait a minute, Pastor Jeff, you're taking an extreme. We're talking about the major religions of the world, Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, Christianity, Islam. They're all fundamentally the same. No, they're not. They fundamentally contradict one another at their core. The problem is in Western society, the Christian is usually the one who takes the hit as we're the only ones being accused of claiming exclusivity. But that's because most of the world has a, a lack of understanding where the five major religions of the world are concerned. Just one example quickly, uh, Gautama Buddha was born a Hindu. Did you know that? And he renounced the two fundamental doctrines of Hinduism, the, the authority of the Vedas, the Hindu scriptures, and the caste system. Uh, he did not agree or accept these things, and he began his own search for enlightenment, uh, came up with the four noble truths and the eightfold path and extinguishing of desire in some kind of nirvanic pursuit. Buddhism was born out of the rejection of Hinduism and its core beliefs, major fundamental doctrines associated with it. Buddhism is exclusive, Hinduism exclusive, Islam exclusive, atheism in fact is extremely exclusive in its claims. It denies, it categorically rejects anything to do with the supernatural. It says that the entire world is a material world only. 
In fact, you've heard me say that atheism is a logical impossibility because atheism postulates an absolute negation. It says there absolutely is no God. And the only way you could know that there absolutely is no God is to have absolute knowledge of the universe, which no one has. There was a debate one time, now stay with me. Those of you who hate this kind of thing, you just pay attention. <laughs> I'll get to your stuff in a second. Remember what we're trying to do here. We're trying to help people far from God come near, and they're going to have these questions. And so a Christian uh, a philosopher was in a friendly debate with an atheist, and it came to a point in the debate where the Christian philosopher said to the atheist, look, if I draw a circle, and this represents the entirety of our universe, how much of the universe does science really understand? And thank God, <laughs> pun, the atheist <laughs> was honest. And he said, well, I would say we understand about this much. And this is what I've been trying to say over the last few months. There's so much we do know, but man, there's so much we don't know, the vastness of the universe. So the Christian philosopher took the pen and said, okay, can you not at least admit that it's possible that God is in this area out here? That there's so much you don't know yet. Now, atheism is extremely exclusive, and the new atheists actually want to eradicate all religion from planet Earth because they say if they can eradicate all religion, that the world will have peace. Now, here's my first question. What happened to tolerance and inclusivity? Alastair McGrath points out, the 20th century gave rise to one of the greatest and most distressing paradoxes of human history that the greatest intolerance and violence of that century were practiced by those who believed that religion caused intolerance and violence. Lenin, Stalin, Hitler, Pol Pot, all pragmatic atheists. Atheism has taken far, far more lives than any misguided Christian or religious person ever thought about taking. And here's the point. All religions are not fundamentally similar. They are superficially similar at best and contradict each other at their fundamental cores. And you've heard me say that just because two things have something in common doesn't mean they have everything in common. I have ears. Elephants have ears. That doesn't make me an elephant. Stephen Turner, an English journalist, said, we believe, look, how, look at the humor in this. We believe that all religions are basically the same, at least the ones we read were. They all believe in love and goodness. They only differ on matters of creation, sin, heaven, hell, God, and salvation. When we define inclusivity as all ideas are equally valid and equally true, it violates the foundation for the reason for debate and logic itself. It works under a false assumption. But third, I've never really met a true inclusivist. They don't exist. My next door neighbor in New Zealand, I've shared with you, I shared my heart with him. It took about four hours and at the end of it, after offering these truth statements, and what I believed were objective, subjective, and empirical evidences, looked at me and said, hey, Pastor Jeff, if that works for you, great. Forget about truth. If it works, if it makes you feel better, great. So my immediate response was, really? What if child sacrifice works for me? Is that okay? What if robbing banks works for me? What if starting a cult and abusing children works for me? Is that okay? Well, his response was, well, I'm an inclusivist. All religions are equal. And I said, really? Jim Jones? Charles Manson, he said, well, every, everyone except those. <laughs> All worldviews are exclusive at some point because truth by nature is exclusive. It excludes all that is false. So I asked my friend Phil, I said, hey, what religion are you? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you said all religions are equally valid, equally true. Which religion do you follow? He said, well, I'm unaffiliated at the moment. And this is what I've learned. People who claim that all religions are equally valid, equally true, are not affiliated with any. Fourth, almost over. This is a big one. The reason Christians are often discriminated against in our common world today is because we are seen to be arrogant. Okay? They'll look at a Christ follower and say, you guys, you think you have the way to God. Now, this goes a long way back. Even in the 1950s, there was a missionary in Africa who was confronted with this illustration that I'm about to give you. Somebody came to him and said, hey, look, you, this thing about you knowing the truth, the reality is that religion can be compared to three blind men approaching an elephant. The first blind man feels his way around and touches the trunk of the elephant and therefore says, elephants are long and flexible creatures. 
The second blind man happens upon the leg of the elephant and says, no, they're not. They're thick and round like a tree trunk. And the third blind man reaches the side and says, no, elephants are large and flat creatures. And then the would-be philosopher said, religion is like elephant, the elephant, and the three blind men. They all grasp part of the truth, but none of them have all of the truth. Now, do you understand what's wrong with this example? The only way you could know that each of them has part of the truth is if you yourself have the whole truth, that you see the whole elephant, which you're claiming to claim would be arrogant and a sense of superiority. Tim Keller describes this better than anybody in his book, The Reason for God. He says, skeptics believe that any exclusive claims to a superior knowledge of spiritual reality cannot be true. But this objection is itself a religious belief. It assumes God is unknowable or that God is loving but not wrathful or that God is an impersonal force rather than a person who speaks in scripture. In addition, their proponents believe they have a superior way to view things. They believe the world would be a better place if everyone dropped the traditional religion's views of God and truth and adopted theirs. Therefore, their view is also an exclusive claim about the nature of spiritual reality. If all such views are discouraged, then this one should be as well. If it is not narrow to hold this view, then there's nothing inherently narrow about holding to traditional religious views. What he's saying is these accusations that exclusivists are arrogant really self-destruct because those who accuse Christians of arrogance are they themselves claiming a more superior way to look at God and religion. And finally, and this is a short one, inclusivity claims that it's impossible to know anything with certainty. Now, I've mentioned this so many times, I don't need to tell you the story. College guy comes into my office, Pastor Jeff, I like you, but it's impossible to know anything with certainty. My response is, are you certain that it's impossible to know anything with certainty? So, <laughs> self-destruct. Okay, now, raise your hand if you felt like you just had a root canal while being forced to listen to country music. That's... <laughs> Here's what I like to say to people, and it's important that you go through that. It's important that you hear that. Jesus may be exclusive, but he's the most inclusive, exclusivist you're ever going to find. Because no matter where you're from, no matter what language you speak, no matter what you've done, where you've been in the past, all are welcome. One and all are welcome to the table of God. Like Delmar says in my favorite movie, Old Brother War Art Thou, come on in, the water is fine. Now, once we expose the idea that this kind of inclusivity that suggests that all ideas are equally valid and equally true is bereft of logic and practicality, then we can look at the real issue. Now remember, many of you have seen this, but West Covina will be watching this weekend. And there's going to be a lot of people who've not been to church in a very long time with us this weekend, who've been invited by their one life. It's going to be packed out with new people. What is the core? What is the... You know, it's one thing to say, okay, Christianity is coherent. Any worldview has to answer two questions. It has to, first of all, be coherent in origin, meaning, morality, destiny. That means it has to be consistent in his answer to those issues. But the second thing, any worldview, any faith system has to be existentially felt. In other words, the question is, how does that change anything? So what? So Jesus is the way to go. How does that impact my, how does that affect me? Well, the, the beautiful part of this message is that the reason it's exclusive is that the gospel basically tells you that if you think you can be accepted by God on the basis of how good you are, you're in big trouble. All world religions tell you you've got to have more good than bad to be accepted before God. And if I ask people to write their names on which half of the 100% goodness and 0% goodness scale, I've never met anyone yet that put their name below the 50% mark. Why? Because the assumption is unless you have more good than bad, you're going to go to hell. Jesus comes along and says, you got it all wrong, man, because humanity's not the standard. I'm the standard. And if you got 99.9% .9 good, you're still separated from me because I am a holy God. And what most people do is severely overestimate their own goodness and severely underestimate the holiness and goodness of God. And so Jesus comes along and says, I got good news. Now, it looks bad at first because no man or woman can measure up. I can't, you can't, no one can. But Jesus says, there's another way. That God is holy, and that requires him. You would expect God, if he existed, to be righteous, pure, and holy. Would you not? You wouldn't expect God to struggle with sin. <laughs> you would expect that God to be a God of judgment and justice. 
even delayed justice, but justice nonetheless. And so the Bible tells us you're right, God is holy, and that requires him to separate himself from all sin. The problem is you're a sinner. Did you know that? We're sinners. We become the objects of the separation of God, not the community of God. Fortunately, the Bible says God is also love, and he wants to show us grace and mercy and forgiveness. The beauty of this is how can God meet the requirements of both sides of his nature? He can't violate one while keeping the other because he's God, he's complete, he's whole. And the answer is the, the beautiful, brilliant, in the mind of God gospel, he sends his son. His son takes all your sins, past, present, future, nails them to the cross, so the requirements of God's holiness are met and the requirements of God's love are met as well because instead of you dying, he gave what was most precious to him so he would not lose you. He turned his back on his own son so he would never have to turn his back on you. That is the gospel. And you will find this good news nowhere in ancient history, modern history. You will find this philosophy in no other religious system that you are saved by grace because of someone who did something for you rather than you trying to be good enough to earn favor with God. And the reality is, if, if you believe that Christianity is an accurate reflection of the nature, the workings, the doings of God, that means that all other religious systems are erroneous in their statements about God because they diametrically oppose the fundamental core of Christianity. Now, let me give you another example. The Quran is the only historical document that claims Jesus did not die on the cross. Greek, Roman, pagan, Jewish historians all agree that Jesus died historically on a cross. Only Islam denies the historical reality. In their eyes, and please excuse my attempt at humor again, I love the movie Princess Bride. In their eyes, Jesus was only mostly dead. Not all the way dead. And so they deny the death of Jesus. They deny the atoning sacrifice of Jesus for sin. They deny the necessity of blood of Jesus for forgiveness. However... Our love for our Muslim brothers and sisters should increase, not decrease, right? There should be no violence, no hatred. We should love all people because one and all are welcomed in. Now, are you aware, and this is what we don't hear if we don't read the right stuff, and I say the right stuff, objective journalism, which hardly ever exists anymore. But do you know that in places like Iran right now, there are hundreds of thousands coming to Christ almost every day? Did you know that? And they're coming through three avenues. One, they're discovering an incoherence. How can Allah be love and violent at the same time? Second, through dreams. The Bible says if you seek God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you're going to find him. There are plenty in Islam who are seeking God and finding him. And Jesus seems to be revealing himself through dreams. Third, through benevolence. I remember when I was in... New Zealand and the tsunami, I think 2004, struck eastern part of Asia, and so many people died. It was the Christians who came in to help the Buddhists and Muslims recover with aid and pure drinking water and food and supplies. And I remember an article in the New Zealand Auckland Herald saying something like this, if it were not for the Christians, we don't know how we would have coped. And this is coming from Muslims and Buddhists. So the benevolence of Christ followers, dreams, the incoherence of love and violence, thousands in countries that have previously been Buddhist or Hindu or Muslim, thousands are coming to Christ. Sheikh Hussein, who is the leading Shiite cleric in Damascus, after a three-hour conversation with a Christian apologist, a very amicable conversation, the crowd's listening, very amicable conversation, finally at the end of it, Sheikh Hussein, the leading Shiite cleric in Damascus, said, You know, Professor, I think the time has come for we in the Islamic world to stop asking if Jesus died and start asking why. And the Christian apologist said, Can I quote you on that? And he said, Yes, you can. Now, there are so many other things, but you have to understand that if it's true that you are separated from God because of your sin, then you're going to need an atonement. Someone is going to have to pay the penalty for your sin, and there's only one who offers you that, and there's only one who rose from the dead to give you objective proof that you can trust him. Okay, Pastor Jeff, I got it. Stay with me here. Got to go fast now. This is the part you'll like. <laughs> Perhaps the greatest message that Jesus offers 
is he tells you that when you receive him as Savior and Lord, that the power and the Holy Spirit of God comes into your life. Nobody else offers you this and changes the way you think and what you see and how you feel and what you're able to do. In fact, I've worded it like this. Number one, only Jesus fulfills the deepest longings of the human heart. Again, I love my wife. My wife loves me. But there is a love she can't give me. And there is a love I cannot give her, and I'm still looking for it. And you find it only in Christ, an unconditional love, an unconditional acceptance, an unconditional support. When Jesus dies for your sins, it clears the path. You understand? It clears the path. You are clean and pure because your sins have been forgiven. And in that kind of house, Jesus can come and live. And when he comes into your life to live as the comforter, the parakletos, the one who comes alongside of, then you have a love that never fades, an acceptance that's not based on your performance, and a significance that nothing in this world can ever give you. Do you remember a few weeks ago we talked about the Acts 7 Stephen story? Remember? And when Stephen is dying, he looks up and he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father, not seated like we usually find Jesus, but Jesus is standing in the throne room of God, which is symbolic that Jesus is an advocate for Stephen. He's the ultimate balcony person. He's saying, come on, Stephen, you can do it. My presence is in you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And that's what Christ offers you. You're not alone in this. And why does that matter? Why does that matter so much? Well, first, again, no other faith system offers you the internal presence of the Spirit of God. And by the way, logically speaking, come on now, it's possible If God exists, he would not be limited by anything he himself has created. Time and space are a creation of God, which means God is not limited by time and space, which makes it possible for God, if he really exists, to be in every single one of our lives at the same time. He can be helping me at the same time he's helping you. And so we need a God like that because every single day of your life, There are people all around you sticking a hose in your tank, taking a deep breath and trying to siphon all the fuel right out of you. And it drains your life, man. Come on, there are people all around you. They're they're joy challenged, remember? They're dream squashers, (laughs) fault finders. We call them basement people. And we call them that because they're people who create slow leaks in your balloon and try to drag you down into the dungeon. And they're all around you. They don't mean to do this, but that doesn't matter. They still do it. You're in desperate need of balcony people, people who will fill your tank, people who cause you to breathe a little bit easier and who breathe life into you. And this is what the Bible says happens in God's community, that we're filled with the Spirit of God, and then we become the community of God, and then we're each other's greatest cheerleaders and encouragers. But more than that... The Bible tells us that there is one who is the ultimate balcony person, and that's Jesus himself, who stands at the right hand of the Father, cheering you on and giving you something special that we're going to mention just in a moment. But the first thing, the the deepest cry of the human heart is to not be alone. And Jesus offers you this prevailing presence in your life. Now, stay with me. That brings me to the second one. Only Jesus gives a satisfactory answer to the most troubling question of our lives. And this goes back to Nobody else gives you a satisfactory explanation for the pain and the suffering and the reality, I'm sorry, that sometimes your life just sucks. Come on. Nobody else even addresses it. Dr. John Polkinghorne, my favorite illustration, quantum physics. So he's not lacking in any mental capacity here. At Cambridge University, he teaches quantum physics. And he says, you know... The, the, the uh, relationship between the expansion and contraction of the universe in the early picoseconds, a picoseconds is the time it takes something traveling the speed of light to cross a hair's breadth. So he said, the relationship between the expansion and contraction of the early moments of the universe required such design and fine-tuning that it would be like you and me taking a bow and arrow and shooting at a one-inch target 20 billion light years across the universe and hitting it every time. And Dr. Polkinghorne said, you know, when I realized that, how God could take 
the chaos of the early stages of the universe, chaotic, and bring beauty and pattern and design into it, how much more then can God take the chaos of your life and bring beauty and pattern and design into it? See, we've said numerous times that we are people of the cross, and that means what? It means that it's possible for you to be in the worst place of your life and be in the center of the will of God at the same time. Because only God can connect all the dots, and only He knows how He's going to use all of these things for His glory, and ultimately, ultimately, He has His best intentions for you. No other faith system offers you that. Yes, we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but we do not walk alone. And we may not have an exhaustive understanding of everything that we suffer, but the one thing we do know because of who Jesus is and what he's done is that you have the Spirit of God living on the inside of you to give you the right word at the right time, to give you power when you need it. And even though there are many Christians that will never discover this, it is real. It is a present reality. And those who do, it changes absolutely everything. And then third, only Jesus gives an objective proof of future hope. I love this statement. I love the attitude with which a Christian can live. Remember, I think I shared with you that uh, a lady called in on a radio program in New Zealand once and said, Pastor Jeff, I I, I like to listen to you talk and I I think you're a good guy, but there's no objective proof whatsoever that anything's going to happen after we die. And I always like to bring in the example that Paul uses as he employs the environmental sciences of 1 Corinthians 15. And he says, you know... We understand so much about the universe, but there's so much we don't understand. For instance, how is it that a seed goes down into the ground, dies, decomposes, and springs forth into a beautiful apple tree? We know that it does happen. How it happens, we don't know. And Paul says, look at that example in agriculture. So we don't know how, but based on the resurrection of Jesus, which is a historical reality, you and I can know that we're going to go down into the ground, die, decompose, but we're going to spring forth into beautiful new life. And Paul says the latter life is far more glorious than the former life. And that's why we say around here, Jesus does something special for us. He gives us a constant vacation attitude. And we use the example of how if you know you're going on vacation on Monday and you're at work on Friday, it's amazing what you can tolerate. I mean, you, you, people can say things to you, doesn't matter, lunch can be bad, doesn't matter, the boss can get, because in your mind you're thinking, that's, do whatever you want, man, because I'm out of here on Monday, I'm on Miami Beach. You know, And so we live with that attitude as Christ followers. Yes, the world's going to throw stuff at us constantly. But our attitude is, go ahead, give me your best shot, because I'm going to be out of here someday, and I'm going to live with Jesus in eternity because of what he did on the cross. You and I know that as beautiful and wondrous as this world really is, that it's tainted by sin. The oceans are beautiful, but they can kill you. The mountains are gorgeous. They can kill you. The elements all around you can can bring joy to your life, but they can also bring your life to an end. But the king is going to return one day. And what he started as a deposit in each of us through his Holy Spirit, he's going to bring to completion. And that's why Revelation 21 says there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Folks, listen. Do you know why it's so important that West Covina launched, that Etiwanda launched, that we're here in San Dimas and churches are launching all through the South Pacific? Do you know why? Do you know what the deepest desire of humanity really is? Hope. Hope. The difference between the Christian faith and every other faith system is that the hope we have is based on an objective historical reality of the resurrection We don't just shout platitudes at each other. We shout truth to each other. And we know that truth is objectively supported by the historical person of Jesus Christ. No other faith system gives you that. And then finally, only Jesus has the power to transform lives. Now, please hear me on this. There are people who are going to be at West Covina. There are people in this room right now. There's some addiction in their life that's stuck to them like Velcro. It's sucking the life right out of them. Their souls are disintegrating. By the way, everybody has an addiction. Everybody. You have something in your life to distract you from the things you really should be thinking about. Unfortunately for this generation, for most of you, it's your phone. 
you can't put it down because it somehow distracts you from having to think about what your life is really like right now. That's why you don't put it down at the table to talk to your parents or your friends. Conversation. That's why we're all getting more and more isolated from each other because we don't want to deal with reality. The Bible tells you you don't have to be that way. And I know you Star Trek fans are going to love this. Do you remember, I think, was it the Wrath of Khan? And somebody will clear this up later. <laughs> but do you, remember, do you remember the Genesis effect? And in the Genesis effect, they would shoot a torpedo into a planet that would reorganize matter and then create habitable worlds for colonization. Well, Jesus comes along and he says, not only am I going to give my life for yours to make you pure and clean, but I'm going to inject my life into you. I am going to spiritually inject a spiritual torpedo. And I'm going to reorganize you. And I'm going to raise you from the dead. And you're going to walk a new life. And you're going to be able to hear me. I say this and sometimes when you say it too often, you stop thinking about it. Jesus tells you that you're going to see things you've not seen before. See, the problem in the West is you're no longer open to dreams. You're going to feel things you've never felt before. Sometimes you're going to be in a worship service and God wants to overwhelm you with his presence, but you think you had some bad lasagna the night before. <laughs> and you're going to be able to do things, things that you thought you could not do. You're going to be able to do them now. See, th this is not just some kind of abstract conversation. This is a spiritual reality that is to be felt. Jesus says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And let me tell you something. The only hope for every person in this room is that spiritual torpedo in your life that gives you the power, the power. And when, as soon as you start to realize you don't have to live this defeated life, as soon as you truly realize that and believe it, things will change. Until then, it's like a treasure. It's like, it's like somebody who buried a uh, million dollars in your backyard and every day you walk over it but you never dig it up. You've got to have your eyes open. Some of you should be praying, God, I don't understand but open my eyes to the power that is in me. Let me end. I've told you this story before but you know that's the beauty of getting older. You can't remember if you've told it and where you told it. <laughs> So in your mind, you feel pretty good about it. Hey, let me tell you a story you've never heard. I... But it's appropriate. It is. I, I think I did share this with you, but I know that there are people at West Covina this weekend that would not heard it, and they need to hear it. Because the only hope you have and the only hope this world has is Jesus Christ. That's it. That's it. And let me tell some of you who think that the political situation is the end of everything. You, 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 you're, you got too much, you have way too much confidence in men and governments. Something that goes far beyond that. So Ravi Zacharias, I told you when we met in Atlanta, reiterated the story of where he got to meet with Sheikh Halal, who's one of the founders of Hamas. And they each got to ask a question, but they couldn't present a rebuttal, so they each asked a question, and then he answered it. Now he's... Remember, this guy's responsible for who knows how many deaths by suicide bombings. Why Ravi was invited was a miracle. But he was there. So they're all leaving. He's walking out. God positions him beside Sheikh Halal on the way to the car. And Ravi said, I don't know what came over me, but he does. It's a spiritual torpedo that, gone into, that went into him years ago that gives him the right word at the right time to influence the world. Same one you have. And he said, I looked at Sheikh and I said, Sheikh, do you mind if I mention something to you? Sheikh said, no, of course not, Dr. Zacharias. What is it? He goes, Sheikh, not too far from where we are on a mountain, Abraham took his son Isaac. Now you say it's Ishmael, we say it's Isaac, but it doesn't matter for this point. Abraham took his son on the mountain and was going to sacrifice him. And the knife started to come down. And do you remember what happened? He said, yeah. God, Allah, stop the knife. Yeah, but what happened next, Dr. Rock, Dr. Zechariah said? He said, well, what happened next is he said, God will provide a lamb. So he knew, Sheikh, Sheikh knew the story. Ravi said, not too far from that mountain is another mountain. And on that mountain of Golgotha, 
God was bringing the knife down on his own son, but this time he didn't stop it because Jesus is the lamb who takes away the sins of the world. And then he looked at Sheikh Halah and he said, Sheikh, until we receive the son that God himself has offered, you and I will keep offering our sons and daughters on the battlefields of this world for land and power. The point is, the only thing that can overcome hate is a stronger love. And the only way you can have a stronger love that overwhelms your hate is that if you have the love of God in you, which happens when the Spirit of God comes on the inside to live. Jesus pragmatically is the only hope for this world, but spiritually speaking, the changing, the transformation of who we are inside can only happen when God comes from the outside in to change not only what you do, but what you want to do. And that's why Jesus is the only way to God. And one and all are welcomed to the table. But it's Jesus' table and no one else's. Father, I thank and praise you for the reality of Christ and what he's done for us. And I, I pray that this church, no matter where she goes in the future, would continue to honor that. That we will honor it. As we go forward on my watch, as we go forward on those who will come after me in the future, I pray that this thing will always be central, be core, be fundamental, that Jesus died for us and his death makes us pure that God may enter in so that all who call on the name of the Lord may be saved. In his name we pray and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Oh, I see that you're done. I hope you enjoyed that video. There's two more just like it right here and right here. You can also subscribe to get notified of all future videos that come out on this channel. And if you want to continue the conversation from the video you just watched, go in the description below and click the join our Facebook community group. And that's where people just like you and me will be continuing this conversation.